Hello, everyone. My name is Ava Michael. I am an AmeriCorps wildlife educator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And with me today is Jess Wolf, who is also um, or who is a conservation educator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Jess will be helping me with everyone's questions and making sure everything goes smoothly today. So we will be using the chat box or for your responses during the presentation. And at the very end of the presentation, we will go through the Q&A box to answer any questions you might have. Now, before we get started, let's go over a few ground rules. Now, first off, I wanna thank you for joining the Nevada Department of Wildlife for a conservation education program. This is a family program and is rated PG. Profanity or inappropriate behavior will not be tolerated in the chat or Q&A box, and all questions in the chat or Q&A box should be on topic, and failing to follow these guidelines will result in being muted in the chat or Q&A box or being removed from the live stream. All right, so today's presentation is titled Good Dogs Bring Bags. And what are we gonna be covering? Well, we're gonna go over the importance of dogs, um, why dogs have restrictions in certain public land areas, and some negative impacts that dog can have if they aren't monitored correctly, and keeping dogs on leashes and how that is, is very important for those recreational areas, and whether or not dog waste could be used as a fertilizer and whether or not it does break down. And then we're gonna cover some diseases that can, um, can result from dog waste in animals as well as humans. And then we're gonna go over some of the, the doggy essentials for a good walk and what you can do. All right, so of course dogs, they're, they have long been considered our best friends. The current global dog population is estimated to be around 900 million and it is still increasing. So we have a lot of dogs out there, although some aren't owned by people or aren't considered pets. Um, there are a lot of people that have pets and who love these animals, um, but many people have bonded with their pets, especially those who have quarantined with them over this past year. And many take them out for, for recreational activities like backpacking, hunting, and so on. All right, so whether you are a cat or a dog person or love them both equally, it is undeniable that dogs are important. Many, um, many are used as service or disability dogs. Um, many use them for hunting, especially in Nevada. I've noticed a lot of people have hunting dogs and some use them for cattle herding. Also, they can be great guard dogs. Not all of them are equally as good at guarding things, but a lot of people feel safer with a dog at home. And also companionship. They can be our best friend. I know I mentioned this before, but especially during quarantine, as more people have worked from home, people have gotten a lot closer with their dogs. And some dogs have even participated in some Zoom meetings. And they offer a better quality of life overall. Studies have shown that people are a lot more relaxed whenever they do have a dog around them. And also they force us to get outside. Um, they force us to go on those walks. A lot of people take them out daily or even twice a day. So they really force us to go on those walks, to go on those hikes. And a lot of people will take them out to those recreational areas and to some public land areas. So Nevada is especially great for dogs. Um, Nevada is ours. 63% of Nevada, which consists of 48 million acres, belongs to the American people. Now I'm gonna give a brief history lesson about why that is. So in 1846, the United States and Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, ending the Mexican-American War. And part of the treaty included transferring all the land in what is now Nevada from the Mexican government to the federal government of the United States. And when Nevada became a state in 1864, its constitu constitution sorry, explicitly said that the state wouldn't claim any public land that wasn't spoken for. And this left the vast majority of Nevada's land in the public estate managed by the federal government. Now today, Nevada contains 48 million acres of public land, accounting for 63% of the state, 
which is managed by the Bureau of Land Management or the BLM. So this land is managed and there are certain restrictions, for the, but for the most part, we can access this land and we have great recreational activities because of this. We can go on camping trips, we can go hiking, backpacking, we can go hunting, and we can even go fishing. All right, so there is a significant overlap between those that love dogs and those that love public lands. There are 640 million acres of protected public land in the United States, which is nearly 28% of the total surface. So that's a lot of area that we can go explore. And if we want to, we can take our dogs with us to those areas and run off some steam and maybe run off some energy that they might have. So there are different restrictions and different regulations for different areas of land. I'm going to go over a quick, quick overview of some of these restrictions or maybe how friendly a dog or an area might be to dogs. Um, but the most, the areas that are most likely to be dog friendly consist of wilderness areas, um, national trails, national forests and grasslands, national historic parks, um, the Western Bureau of Land Management lands, and state parks. And the areas that are generally dog friendly with restrictions include the national parks, national monuments, national seashores, and national lake shores. And then the areas that are most likely to prohibit dogs include the national wildlife refuges. And you can imagine why that is. We don't always want the, the dogs to kind of stress out that wildlife or maybe harm that wildlife. So we do want to be considerate of these different restrictions and these different areas of land because there are reasons behind why they might have those restrictions for dogs. All right, so there are different types of public land, which is why there are those different restrictions as well. Um, so while the East Coast certainly enjoys its small share of public lands, the great majority is in the West. And the entities responsible for these lands include the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Park Service. So this is kind of why there are those different restrictions and why um, those areas might be managed differently. So I have not been using exact language for this and giving you exact um, exact areas for for what can be used for public or for um, dog recreation. And this is because um, it's impossible to say definitively whether the particular public land you'd like to visit allows dogs. So it's important to do your research anytime you want to go camping or hiking in these areas um, because different areas of public land um, will have those different restrictions, but they do also have websites and clear pet regulations on those websites. So it's fairly easy to research ahead of time. And it's important that we do that just that way we're considerate of these areas and make sure that we're not having a bigger impact than we need to. So dogs can have many negative impacts um, if they aren't monitored correctly. So they can have negative impacts on recreational areas, on wildlife and other animals, as well as the people visiting those recreational areas or even yourself. Um, so we're going to go over some more information about that. But it's important that we keep um, our public land um, beautiful and that we, we keep it pristine so that way we have it for a longer period of time. We don't want to go and degrade those areas if we don't need to. And also it's common courtesy whenever you are bringing your dog to those areas that you pick up after your dog. I know it's it kind of ruins your day whenever you do step into some dog waste. It's just not fun. It doesn't smell good and we just want to avoid those situations to anybody visiting those areas. So make sure to bring a leash and pick up after your dog. Now there are actually dog leash laws. In general, dogs must be kept on leashes in Nevada wherever um, they are out in public. And in general, um, the, well, the only exception for this is in um, dog parks or certain rural areas. And those areas will have signage and it will be pretty obvious um, if you can bring those 
bring dogs into those areas um, without a leash. But even hunting with unleashed dogs is unlawful in Nevada um, if the dog is pursuing big game mammals other than mountain lions or any wildlife in a state-owned wildlife management area. So dog leashes are regulated mostly at the county and city level rather than the state level. So always check those local rules before taking your dogs out in Nevada. And dog leashes, they protect other animals. They make people feel more comfortable. People aren't as worried about being bitten. Um, a lot of those laws are to prevent people from getting bitten because we don't really want to stress out those dogs and cause them to get aggressive. Um, and leashes can prevent that. So it all, also leashes ensure that you are cleaning up after your pets. If you're constantly watching your pets, you'll know exactly um, what areas they might have they might have disturbed, whether that's digging a hole or doing their business. We just want to make sure that we're not impacting those areas. So I am not able to open my comment box, but Jess will help me out with the comments here. But I want you to put in the comment section whether you think dog poop is a good fertilizer. So if, if you think dog poop is a good fertilizer, you can put yes, or you can put no if you don't think it is a good fertilizer. But I'm just curious what people think about this. I see um, a yes, a maybe, and a no. All right. So, Unfortunately, dog poop cannot be considered a good fertilizer. Not all poop is created equal. And um, dogs have a high protein based diet that creates a very acidic excrement or waste product. And cow manure is more commonly used because it um, is good for vegetation because it started out as vegetation. So that's kind of one of the ways you can tell whether something might be a good fertilizer is how it started off because it probably contains some of those nutrients and some of those properties. But dogs typically have a very different diet. Most dog foods today are composed of beef, chicken, and or pork products. Um, and this creates a very high acidic waste product that is not good for grass and can leave your backyard looking terrible. I'll go into that in a minute. Um, but dog diets overall have very high protein, they're very acidic, and they can be considered toxic to vegetation as well as other animals. All right, so um, dog waste will take about a year to fully decompose. So it takes a pretty long time, um, to, a long time for that to go away. And it will leave burn marks in grass because of how acidic dog waste is and it's high in nitrogen and phosphorus and that's the reason why. Um, but it doesn't just decompose, it also adds harmful bacteria and nutrients to local waters when it's not disposed of properly. All right, so let's talk about the ecosystem. So, um, an ecosystem is simply a biological living community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So a lot of these organisms will have um, symbiotic relationships and will depend on each other for food and nutrients and so on. Um, but this is just a very connected um, area of land and a healthy ecosystem can handle about two dogs um, per square mile. However, in many cities, there are close to 125 dogs per square mile, which is plenty to throw off an ecosystem, especially if some owners are not picking up pet waste on a regular basis. All right, so animal waste contains two main types of pollutants that harm local water waters. Um, um, and this includes nutrients and pathogens. So when this waste ends up in water bodies, it decomposes, releasing nutrients that can that cause excessive growth of algae and weeds. So this is why you might see a body of water that doesn't look so healthy. It might actually be a result of dog waste or some other type of waste or something similar that's just causing that algae bloom in that area. Um, but the it can 
this makes the water murky, it makes it smell, it makes it green, and even unusable for swimming, boating, or fishing. So if you see that type of body of water, you probably want to avoid it because it might be contaminated, it might cause um, you to get sick. But the pathogens, um, disease-causing bacteria and viruses can also make local waters unswimmable and unfishable and have caused severe illnesses in humans. So it can have a pretty big impact whenever you don't pick up waste over a large period of time and over um, and with many dogs. So this, this can accumulate. And although you might not realize that, um, that your dog is having an impact, Whenever you consider all the dogs that are also maybe having their own impacts, it can create, it can really devastate an area. So let's talk about water quality. Um, negative uh, dog waste has many negative impacts on water quality. Studies have traced 20% to 30% of the bacteria in water samples from urban watersheds to dog waste. So dog waste has a big impact on your water and the water that is available to you um, and how clean that water is. Now, there are ways of preventing this. You can avoid letting your dog do their business within 200 feet of a water body. And um, you, can also, you can also just never throw dog waste into a storm drain. Some people have done this, and this can be very bad for the storm drain. Although some people might believe that this provides more nutrients for that water, um, it's very toxic. And whenever this is done over a long period of time, it can really contaminate that water and cause that sort of algae to build and grow. Dogs can also have an impact on wildlife as well as other dogs. It can spread diseases um, to other animals like fire or diseases. It can spread diseases to other um, animals such as viruses, bacteria, as well as parasites. And bad bacteria do or dog waste has a lot of bad bacteria. One gram of dog waste can contain 23 million fecal coliform bacteria. Now coliform is bacteria that are always present in the digestive tracts of animals, including humans, and are found in their waste. They are also found in plants and soil material. Now E. coli is a major spe species of the fecal coliform group and of the five general groups of bacteria that compromise the total comprise the total coliforms, only E. coli is generally not found growing and reproducing in the environment. So cons consequently, E. coli is considered to be the species of coliform bacteria that is best the best indicator of fecal pollution and possible presence of pathogens. And coliform bacteria can be very harmful. Um, it does not, uh, coliform bacteria do not typically cause disease. However, some rare strains of E. coli can cause serious illness. And one of the dangerous strains of E. coli has been found in cattle, chickens, pigs, and sheep. And, oops. all right. And typically, typically this is caused from eating um, uncooked hamburgers, but it, E. coli, this strand of E. coli has also, um, uh, contaminated drinking water supplies. Um, this is more rare than um, eating undercooked meat and getting sick from that. However, this can, this can be very harmful to people whenever they do drink that contaminated water or maybe swim in that water or be exposed to that water that is contaminated. So a single uh, gram contains an estimated 23 million bacteria and this bacteria can include um, E. coli, Giardia, as well as Salmonella. So dog waste can cause diseases in humans. Um, it can cause Giardia, Salmonella, uh, Campylobacter, and pet, pet waste has a big impact. Um, even whenever you don't, whenever you don't see pet waste present. 
Um, if you are maybe gardening in your backyard, maybe didn't clean up that pet waste a long time ago, or maybe if your children are playing in that backyard and the backyard wasn't cleaned properly, um, you can get sick from that. It, anybody that is exposed to that to that dirt or to that soil that might have been contaminated can get sick from that if they don't maybe clean their hands properly um, or if they just come into contact with that. Now, regular scooping um, protects you from a lot of different diseases, um, including parvo, trichinosis, whipworms, hookworms, um, roundworms, giardia, uh, cockadia and other troublemakers. So until dogs learn to wash their paws and clean up after that themselves, regular scooping can protect them from those types of viruses and diseases. So whenever you are going on those walks, um, a, good, a good protocol to have is just to bring your bags um, bring your leash and bring a good supply of water, especially during the summer, um, things are getting drier. And if you are going to be outside for a long period of time, definitely be sure to bring that water. And some of those areas might not have bags available to you. So it's always a good idea to bring those bags. It's easier to remember to pick up after your dog and it makes it a lot, um, a lot easier overall. Also bring that leash just so that way you can manage your dog and um, make sure that they might not go into an area where they might get hurt. All right, so in the United States alone, we use about 14 billion plastic bags annually. Um, so if you don't want um, to contribute to the plastic that is being produced, there is a biodegradable option for you. Uh, I believe you can buy these bags on Amazon now, but I know you can buy them in pet stores. You can buy these biodegradable bags online. So there are other alternatives for you if you don't want to contribute to, um, to the plastic use that is in the United States. There's also a composting option. Uh, weight, however, um, dog waste that, that was produced maybe from a meat-eating dog should not be used for compost piles. You can look up, up um, kind of the restrictions or maybe what is recommended for, um, for different dogs or for different dog foods if you are going to consider composting. There's a lot of online resources available to you for more research, but the EPA, EPA has estimated that you can reduce the volume of dog waste by about 50%. And correct composting can be used for your garden, for your yard, as well as for your trees. And it can kill harmful pathogens, maybe for, for meat-eating dogs, not quite as easily, but for dogs that don't have a meat-rich diet, it can kill some of those pathogens. And it reduces the chances that waste will pollute groundwater and streams, which is always a great thing. If you want to have a positive environmental impact, this is a great way of doing it. All right, so there are two methods that are recommended by, um, by an article from the USDA. It was titled Composting Dog Waste. If you want to look it up, it is available to you and you can, it gives you a step-by-step -step, um, kind of list of how to do this. But there are two methods that you can use to build your compost pile. The first is to collect the materials um, separately and then mix them all up at once. And the advantage of this method is that um, the materials will not begin to decompose compose until mixed. And you will get the highest temperatures and the fastest compost when dog manure, carbon, water, and air are all introduced at the same time. However, this method uh, might have a higher gag factor. It might not be as much fun to do and it might kind of be gross. So if you don't want, if you don't, if you're, or if you want to put, um, to use a less less kind of um, gross method, you can use the second method, which is to add the carbon source to the dog waste as you collect it from the dog yard and mix it as it is placed in the bin. Now this method is also easier. So if you want the easier method, this is 
this is the recommended method to use. And as long as the pile remains dry, very little decomposition should happen until you are ready to turn that pile and add the water because the pile of the mixed dog waste and carbon will have a less offensive odor than if the materials are collected separately. And many people prefer this method. So if you want more information on this, you can, you can access the file titled Composting Dog Waste. Um, it was produced by the USDA. Definitely recommend this if you want to learn more or decide whether or not you want to start composting. And this composting can be used for your garden, so it can be beneficial to you. All right, if you don't want to use those methods, you can also, um, you can also access the doggy bag stations. There are a lot of them present here in Nevada. I found this one in Peace Park in Elko, Nevada. Um, but these, these doggy bag stations can be very helpful if you maybe forgot your bag. Um, and many parks and recreational areas have these courtesy bag and disposal disposal boxes for you. And these are designed specifically for dog waste. So if you don't have this available at your local park, you can ask your town to install one in the park. Um, it's not a very uncommon thing to ask for. So your park should be able to provide you with this. Um, and it makes it a lot easier um, for you as well as for your neighborhood and your community. All right, so this is why um, they install those dog bag stations as well. You can kind of see the compare and contrast of this. Um, if, if trash cans are not covered properly and are not managed properly, they can end up looking like this, this one image where the dog waste is just everywhere. And this is not good because sometimes those bags rip. Also, you can tell nobody is gonna to wanna to use um, this area. They're going to avoid this bench. So it's kind of, it's not a good, um, it's not a good option for those dog waste bags. So this is often why these waste stations are set up. You can see here, this is a station that was set up in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it has this sign to let you know um, to let you know that this is what this is and to kind of give you some instructions. And it also provides some bags for you. It also has a covered trash can receptacle for you. And these covers really help out with the smell. They help kind of cover up the dog waste to make sure that it doesn't get spread over this area. So it's much more minimalist. It's also much cleaner. So these dog waste stations can be very beneficial to these recreational areas. However, if you do go into um, maybe some public land areas that might be more wilderness areas, they probably won't have this available to you. So it's always a good idea to bring your own bags with you. There are actually pooper scooper laws. This is kind of what they've been titled but they do require pet owners to remove dog waste on public as well as private property, um, including neighbors' yards, sidewalks, parks, and schools. And in some states, even your own backyard, they will require that you remove any pet waste within your backyard. Um, and this is different based on, or this, can be different based on the county or your area and maybe some of the regulations. So this is a good thing to look up if you maybe are moving into a new area or are curious about your own area. So always please clean up after your dogs. It's, it doesn't take many steps and it's fairly easily easy to do. And once it's kind of normalized in your head, you won't even think twice about it. Um, just make sure to always bring that bag, always tie that bag, um, and make sure you're in an area that is, that is all right for the dogs to do their business. Um, we don't want to do it by a stream or a body, or a body of water where um, there might be runoff and it might contaminate that area. Um, just because we want those recreational areas to be available to people, we want people swimming in those areas and not, ha not having to worry about um, getting sick from the water. So always make sure that you're away from a water source. Always make sure it's a good area to let your dog do their business. Always clean up after them and make sure that you throw away that dog waste in a trash can that is covered. 
And some states actually, such as Rhode Island, um, have pet waste pickup services. So if you are if you are in an area that might have that avail available to you, this is a good idea. If maybe you want somebody to professionally clean your yard, um, maybe it's your yard has just gotten out of hand or maybe you just don't wanna deal with it. There are services available that can come and pick up your pet waste. I'm not sure about Nevada, but I know Rhode Island as well as Washington and a few other states have this available to you and they will come to your home and clean up your backyard for you. All right, so it's also a good idea whenever we are going into these public land areas, um, just to leave no trace. Now, each of us plays a vital role in protecting our national parks. And as we spend more time outdoors, as it gets warmer and we want to explore those areas more, it's important to be conscious of the effects that our actions may have on plants, animals, and other people, and our, even our entire ecosystem. I mentioned that a one mile of an ecosystem can only handle about two dogs. So we really wanna be mindful of those areas whenever we are taking our pets and our dogs into those areas. So following the Leave No Traces seven principles can help us minimize um, those impacts and they can be applied anywhere at any time while taking part in recreational activities. Now these seven principles were established by the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics and built on work by the U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, and Bureau of Land Management in the mid-1980s. And this relationship continues today. The principles are based on information by scientific research in the field of recreation ecology and human dimensions of natural resources. So take a look at um, their website, if you would like to, there's a lot of science behind this and they provide a lot of good information for how you can minimize those impacts um, whenever you are exploring those areas. So explore, go on the Leave No Trace website, it has a lot of tools available to you. But we're gonna go over those seven principles. These are kind of general, generalized um, views on these seven principles. They have more information on their websites, but the first principle is that you can plan ahead and prepare. So part of this could be bringing um, your dog bags, um, bringing the leash, bringing the water, and just being prepared um, to take care of your dog and make sure that they are taking care of the environment that you are exploring. And then the second principle is travel and camp on durable surfaces. So this is a great one for um, minimizing those impacts on native plants and other organisms within those areas, because we don't really want to travel off those trails and off those pathways. Those trails and pathways were set up for a reason. And this prevents those plants maybe from being trampled on, maybe from your shoes bringing foreign organisms into those areas. Maybe if you're tracking dog waste, you accidentally stepped in it. Um, it prevents you from spreading those contaminants into those areas. So this is always a good policy to have. And the third principle is properly dispose of waste. Always make sure that you bring your bags, especially if you are exploring somebody somewhere that might be considered a wilderness area. And if you are maybe backpacking, it's a good idea to bring an even bigger bag to collect the smaller bags within, just so that way you're not leaving them along the trail. I know I've seen that a few times whenever I've gone out into these areas, people will leave um, a dog bag along the side of the trail and this won't get disposed of properly. There aren't enough people who would move that themselves um, so it's always good to just make sure that whatever you're bringing into an area, you take back out. So leave what you find as well. Don't take the pine cones that, that you might see. Don't take any rocks. Um, those are all part of that ecosystem and that habitat. So we wanna leave it as pristine as possible. Also minimize campfire impacts. Make sure that you are um, setting up your campfire in an area that um, that you are allowed to. You can always ask somebody, um, maybe ask somebody with um, one of the organizations or the departments that are managing that area, whether or not you can camp, set up a camp, 
amplifier within that area. Um, also, just make sure that you put out those embers whenever you leave that fire. You don't want to accidentally start a wildfire. And this is this is something that we can prevent fairly easy, easily. Just make sure that you put out your campfire, make sure that you are setting up that campfire in an area that you aren't damaging the ecosystem and just be mindful of those things. And also respect the wildlife. If you see some wildlife in the distance or even up close, don't, go, don't move closer to it. Don't scare it. Maybe don't make noises because you might stress out that animal. They might run away. Um, and if they were eating, that might prevent them from getting that food source. So we want to leave the wildlife as it is. We don't want to harm it um, or maybe stress it out. And second, or the seventh um, principle is just be considerate. Um, be considerate of those that are around you, of those that are visiting and be considerate of the environment that you are in. All right, so what can you do? You can pick up your dog waste um, if you are in these areas, um, whether that is your yard, whether that is public land. Um, picking up dog waste is a great way of, um, of preventing those environmental impacts that our dog might have or that we might have. And it's a fairly easy thing to do. And always wear a leash. Um, this makes visitors prevents wildlife from getting scared off. And it also just makes sure that we are aware of what our dog is doing. And then also carry dog bags. Make sure that you bring a bag with you. There's not always gonna be a doggy bag station for you. So just bring your own bag. And also make sure that you dispose of that bag in a covered trash can. And if you want to, you can compost and you can use those biodegradable bags. And these are just if you want to go that extra step, maybe be a little bit more of an environmental steward to your area. These are easy ways of doing that. Maybe the compost isn't as easy, but biodegradable bags, those are fairly easy to get. And also just follow the leave no trace principles. These are seven steps that you can look at before, even after um, visiting some of these public land areas, just to make sure that you're monitoring yourself and monitoring um, your dog and just making sure that you're leaving, you're not leaving a lasting negative impact in those areas. And also get outside. The weather is beautiful. We have all of this recreational land available to us. So get outside, make sure you explore what is in Nevada. Maybe if you're in another state, explore that area. It's always good to see what is in your own backyard and kind of the diversity of, um, of wildlife, the diversity of plants. It's always interesting to see what is in your area. All right, so are there any questions about what I've gone over? Well, first, thank you so much, Ava. I know I definitely learned a lot. I had no idea you could compost dog poop. So that was very interesting. I'm gonna have to look into that. Um, we did have one kind of comment. Um, I know that we don't have any, but are there any, when you were searching around doing your research, did you find any good like brochures about dog waste and their impacts that maybe you could share? Um, yes, if you want to, um, you can use my email. I believe it is um, tagged by my, or it is where my name should be. Um, but yes, I have a lot of links that I did find. Um, the no Tra Leave No Trace website, they had a lot of good information on dog waste. The USDA has a lot of information as well as the EPA. There's a lot of departments out there that have gone the extra mile to post um, files and information on dog waste and how you can maybe minimize your impact because this is this has been a big issue and it's something that people don't always think about. But yes, if you want to, you can use my email and I can forward you some of that information avail that is available. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, but we'll give it another minute or so. Um, one tip and trick that I like to use is um, I don't like the smell of the dog poop and I usually have a backpack with me, which is where I like have to put it in the little pockets. Um, so online you can buy these like smell proof little bags um, that are reusable and I put my 
plastic bag into that and seal it up and then you can't smell it for the entire hike. It's great. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, I'm sure, especially if you're backpacking or maybe going into these areas for a while, you definitely don't want to have that smell clinging to you. So that's a, it's a great option to have. Yeah, I, I think that that's a lot of times why you see the um, bags on the end of trails because you don't want to have that smell the entire way. So that's a fun trick. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Well, I'm not seeing anything else. Thank you so much for putting this together. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I hope everyone gained a better understanding of the impact we can have when we bring things into recreational areas without taking them out. So whether this is dog waste or even a granola wrapper, we can leave lasting negative environmental impacts whenever we aren't conscious of these things. So especially with dog waste, um, dog waste is something relatively simple and easy to pick up and throw away. So be mindful of this whenever you are going into these areas, but I definitely encourage you to explore. Um, if you want more information or um, have some questions, you can contact me. This is my email, but thank you everybody for joining me today and I hope everybody has a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon.